Hey, Dustin, thanks for uh, joining me today. Um, I know you got a lot going on, and but I uh, just want to appreciate your time. And uh, I know, uh, sure, yeah. So, Dustin, you know, I know I've I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years, but some of the people out here in the social media world may not know who you are. I, why don't you explain a little bit about yourself and your family and what y'all got going on down in South Texas? Okay, so I appreciate you having us on, Tony. Um, um, so our whole entire operation is based in Floresville, about 30 minutes southeast of San Antonio. And uh, my business partner, Jason Peeler, uh, and I uh, have a company called Dean and Peeler Premium Angus Beef. We have a USDA inspected slaughter plant that's called Dean and Peeler Meat Works. Um, we basically produce and market our own cattle, our own beef um, to direct to restaurants and and uh, retail stores uh, across Texas. And um, we, I'm not originally from South Texas. My partner is, I actually grew up in North Texas up by Wichita Falls uh, near a little town called uh, Henrietta. But uh, Jason and I, uh, Jason and I knew each other through Texas Southwestern Cattle Raiser Association and we're both directors with that. And his um, background was a lot in feeding and finance. And my background was a lot was in, um, um, a lot of meats, a lot of genetics, a lot of marketing and that kind of thing. And so when you put those two, those two pieces together, you end up getting the, uh, the, the structure that you need to build uh, this operation that we're, that we're dealing with now. And so we started in July of 2014 and um, with the sole intent of building a 100% totally vertically integrated beef operation from the same two family names that own the calf the day it was born are the same two family names that are marketing the New York strip the day it's sold. Um, but, but in a commercial volume, not in a smaller volume, but in a, in a commercial volume. And luckily with a lot of hard work, we're at that point now and uh, where we are the, the only totally vertically integrated um, beef label of any commercial size in the United States to our, to my knowledge at, anyway, by far. So uh, it's been a, been a long road. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, we've kind of visited a little bit and I visited with a lot of people across Texas that things are so difficult now for farmers and ranchers to make a living and to, to uh, survive in today's marketplace that you have to look for creative ways to market your product. And you've got to look for creative ways to, to gain profitability and that's one of the things that really impressed me about y'all's operation was that y'all are continually looking for ways, creative ways, marketing ways, and that vertical integration that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know that uh, USDA has been pouring in uh, through some of the uh, federal funding that we've had into some smaller plants, some custom plants, some regional plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a bigger picture where we have some, some choking down or some choke point on the kill capacity on the commercial side. And I've always felt that, you know, these custom plants and these smaller regional plants were the answer. And uh, I, I, have y'all taken advantage of some of that money and what are your thoughts are on how that plays in the big picture? Uh, well, I, yeah, I will say, uh, uh, I think there's without a doubt that the whole industry is going towards a more regional approach to cattle slaughter. And um, uh, nothing against the big plants that were that have been up in in Fort in um, Dodge City and a lot you know a lot of that area. I mean, the, back then, um, back then it was it those plants were built when cheap when diesel was was seventy five cents a gallon, and so it wasn't a big deal to bring the cattle all the way to the food source to their food source at the time. Uh, things have changed a lot now, and uh, I we are seeing a lot of um, a lot of interest but i do believe 100 percent that the whole industry is moving towards a regional approach and i'm not talking a um a small um mom and pop size butcher operation or kill plant operation which there's nothing wrong with that and we'll talk about those in a minute i'm sure but i'm talking about uh, a plant that'll kill a thousand a week um you know two thousand a week something like that which may sound like a lot to some people but that's a drop in the bucket that's half a day that's half a day's worth of kill at a big plant, right? So um, there's some places that, that, that show some interesting opportunity for that. Um, and we're lucky that one of those places is Texas, because if you look at that triangle between 
Houston, uh, down to Corpus Christi, up to San Antonio, Austin, up I-35 to Dallas-Fort Worth. There's 20 million people in that triangle. There's also a Gulf Coast um, uh, corner Milo belt through there where there are feed yards up and down that Gulf Coast. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of cow-calf production in that triangle. So not only do you have the cattle, not only do you have the feed source, but your customer is right out your back door. Uh, the final customer by those 20 million people, I mean. And that that poses an interesting opportunity. Uh, Florida, Georgia area is another area that is real interesting for that. So I, we're already seeing some regional plants go in, uh, but I do believe that um, that's going to just get stronger and stronger. Uh, and you see more of the food service out there wanting to work with more regional plants so that a plant or the, a food service um, company from Florida can truly offer Florida born, resident, born raised and fed and processed uh, product, whether it's beef or anything else. Uh, same thing in Texas. And there's just tremendous amount of interest in that. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of the federal dollars come in. And so you, know, you asked me earlier, did, did, we, um, did we go after any of those federal grants? Initially, we tried. We decided to back off of that. Um, several different reasons I don't really all have to go into now, but um, um, we decided to back off of that. And uh, there were quite a few people that did. There, we are seeing a, um, quite a few new small plants, small little plants that will kill, you know, 20, 30 to 100 a week worth of cattle that are going in in Texas. Um, there's quite a few of them actually. And while I get excited about that, it scares me sometimes a little bit too, just because you could have too many go in. Um, we just came out of a horrible, massive drought. And a lot of those cows, uh, those cow calf operations that may have calves that were going to be fed and intended for those small plants, those cows are gone now. So um, that could be a little bit of an issue there for sure. Yeah. You know, one of the other things that's pretty interesting about this whole marketplace that we live in now is, the, the generation that's coming up, these 20 and 30 year olds, and even into 40 year olds, the households tend to care a lot more about where that beef comes from and where it originates from. And right. uh, people are paying attention to that. So, you know, it goes back to that regional question. <clears throat> you, do you see retailers like HEB and these other retailers really moving towards uh, that branded kind of beef that's uh, coming into their markets? Yeah, they do. ATB does a good job at that. There's there's several others that do a good job at that across the country. Um, um, they are. They will. They will showcase. Um, they will showcase producers from certain areas. Okay, so ATB, for example, has a, an event every May called their Best in Texas event, and they will bring uh, they will bring producers in from across the state and showcase that producer's product. Uh, and I'm not talking just beef, but that'd be pork. That could be poultry too. And a lot of times if things end up working out oh, and there's good demand for that Texas product over that course of the course of that event during May, a lot of times that product gets incorporated into the ones that HEB sells annually. Um, they do a very, very good job at that. Um, we, you see more demand on social media for it, of people wanting to buy a whole and half cabs and quarters and those kinds of things. Uh, we see it in restaurants where we take our, uh, our beef to and, they absolutely want something that is as local as possible. And I will say this, that the, the, the USDA kill plant that we have, we do, mar we do run our own cattle through it that are part of our program, but we process cattle for the public as well. Um, we don't have that many process, or uh, excuse me, we don't have that many customers that, that bring us that calf that they want to take home and and, and put into their freezer and give to their grandkids or spread it with family like that. We don't have that many clients. Most of our custom kill clients are people that are trying to market the, their beef themselves. They just need a processor to do it for them. And I, probably one of the common things we see a lot too is um, in the beef industry, and so, especially uh, in somebody trying to market their own product is that everybody gets excited about the same things initially, which are the steaks which are your ribeye, your strip, and your tender, right? And we all talk about how great those are out of the cattle that we're raising. While I get excited on our label, I'm very thankful and excited that somebody wants to put Dean and Peeler on a menu for a bone-in ribeye at a high-end steakhouse. 
I am just as excited about somebody that wants to come in and say, I want to buy all your ground beef or I want to buy all your shanks or I want to buy all your navels, right? So the ribeye, the strip and the tender only represent around four and a half percent of the weight of the entire carcass. So there's so much more of that animal that you have to move that most people don't ever hear about. So get excited about a carne asada account. Get us excited about a diced beef or asada account or uh, a ground beef or patties, those kinds of things. When you're marketing your own beef, a lot of people try to make, make boxes. They'll make a steak box or this box or that box that has an assortment. Make sure there's ground beef in every one of those because you're if you don't watch it, it'll pile up on you. And you can't go slaughter cattle, your own cattle or more of them just to get more steaks because you're going to pile up on everything else. So really focus on those end cuts and that's going to help suck and pull more of your cattle through the system. And that's going to create more ribeyes and middles that you have access to. You know, those are great points too. Um, I don't think that people really think through that. You know, it's, like you said, they're always looking for the choice cuts there, but they, they tend to forget that there there's all these different uh, cuts out there and, and wants and needs, especially with how our population is blending in Texas and, and throughout right. the country. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you brought up was that, you're, you know, the custom custom killing that you do. And if, if a producer wanted to pursue looking at vertically integrating and marketing his own beef, a couple of questions there. How do they find a reputable, what do you recommend for them to find a reputable kill, custom kill facility? And how do you recommend them working with that? And then two, what kind of cattle are really being desired there? Okay, so uh, one of the big questions there is, is should a producer try to go with a state inspected or a federally inspected plant? The only real difference as far as sales are concerned um, between those two is that, is that you cannot sell any state inspected only product across state lines in a direct sale. Okay, now um, a federally inspected product can be sold anywhere in the United States. Um, the, the, the catch 22 and all that are internet sales. So you can have a state inspected product. You can have a website where somebody can go, go on your website and, and buy an, a beef from you that you mail to them in another state and it can be state inspected product. So that is a loophole in it that um, has not been addressed yet. So from a food safety standpoint, I will say this, yes, our, our federal plant has to jump through more audits, more food safety hoops, um, more um, just a bigger, a bigger magnifying glass than a state inspected plant does. I'm not knocking any state inspected plants by any means, but that is a difference between a federal and state plant uh, from inspection and uh, food safety and those kinds of things. So we went federal from the get go. We were not state inspected. Uh, we went federal from the get go. There, there are um, a shortage of USDA inspectors. That is one reason that is difficult for some state plants to get federal is that it's hard for the USDA to find inspectors to manage and inspect that plant for them. Um, so sometimes you will have what's called a TA inspection or a TA plant. And that's basically where the USDA could come to some state inspectors and say, we need you to inspect this, this federal plant on USDA's behalf. And that's actually how we started. Uh, the USDA did not have an inspector to give us at a time. So there was a state inspector there that was doing it um, under a federal uh, observance. And so as far as finding um, the different water plants, I mean, that's one of the views behind social media right now. You can get on and, and Google, you know, slaughter plant, kill plant, meat processor, that kind of thing. And they're going to pop up. Most all of them have Facebook pages. Most all of them have websites and, uh, and you can find them for sure. So um, I, uh, as far as working with the process, it's kind of ironic we're talking about this because I've got to give a presentation to a breed association tomorrow about this. But um, from our standpoint, as the processor, um, nothing aggravates us more than if somebody has a calf that they need to process <laughs> and they call and get on a wait list with us and they call and get on a wait list with another couple of plants. Oh, yeah. And, let, and let's say that those other plants come open 
and that person ends up slaughtering that calf with the other plants, but never calls us back to let us know they got off that wait list and we've got them booked for a date we think they want and they don't show up. And that's a calf that I can't kill that day because I can't get there one, you know, get one there fast enough. Yeah. Uh, so t- be, a, be a little appreciative of that because um, while there is a demand for this uh, in our business, they're not just lined up at the door waiting to come in. We have to book them and uh, get them on a calendar. And so uh, let your processor know if you, if you don't show up or you, or you can't, you know, for whatever reason. Before you go on to the next part of that question, I, I think it's important to say, I, I have seen some of these kill plants that it's really <laughs> important to engage with them up front, maybe go by and visit with them, see how they're operate because that kill plant and the way that they cut that steak, the way that they cut that beef and the way that they process can make you break you. You could have right. a lot of variance in, uh, in uh, uh, meat, you know, as far as carcass uh, uh, capture off of that animal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Waste. yeah. So, yeah, that yeah, you makes wanna, all the it, difference in the world. It does. If you're, if any of the listeners are, are actually trying to market their own beef, most of the time, the cheapest thing that that butcher can produce out of your calf is going to be ground beef. So, um, there's a lot of cuts that traditionally may have normally gone to a roast or maybe have gone to ground beef that you can have that butcher cook for you or cut for you that you can sell at a higher price, right? So um, a classic example of that is a is a traditional chuck roll. So a traditional chuck roll is usually cut up into a, into a chuck roast, right? But you can, your butcher, if they know what they're doing, they can break that chuck roll apart and produce what's called chuck eye steaks. They can produce what's called Denver steaks. And you can sell those for three times what ground beef costs you to sell. So whatever your processor can do to make as little amount of ground beef as possible um, out of that animal, the better, unless, unless ground beef is what you're after, which we do have some of those clients as well. Yeah. But our cutting sheet, as uh, our cut sheet, as they call it, that we visit with the, the, the customer about uh, as far as how they want their animal processed is very, very lengthy. Um, just because we feel it's our job to make them the most money that they can out of their animal, for sure. And I would imagine that you'd kind of coach them through that too, if they don't have any experience with it. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, there's actually there's new cuts that we, that people uh, have never heard of that we we have to talk with them about. That happens a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, the last part of that question, the original question was, uh, you know, what do you look like from a from a beef quality standpoint? What do you see the trend going to? I know in South Texas and Texas, we've got a lot of eared cattle, bovine indicus kind of cattle, your uh, Brayford cattle, your Brahmin cattle or anything, a heavy Brangus cow. Uh, but I've seen a lot of people, you know, crossing those back with Angus and trying to clean up that leather a little bit. Do you, do you feel like that's important when you're doing vertical integration or does it really not matter all that much? No, hundred percent. I mean, um, it does matter. And um, being able to, produce as high quality of an eating experience as you can for the customer in the end is uh, is what it's all about and um, that has been food services biggest complaint about the beef industry in the past is that it's not like pork and poultry um, it's you know the, the the boring thing about pigs and chickens is that they're all exactly the same as the one next to them the good thing about that from an eating experience is they're all exactly the same right so in the beef cattle world We've got 50 different breeds, however many different crosses, however many different ranchers that live in different environments and different management schemes and ways of doing things. So that's just the way the industry is. And we're not going to change a lot of those things uh, environmentally. But those those variations do contribute to beef products in the end that are inconsistent. So whatever that breeder can do to alleviate a lot of that the better. However, they can clean up their cow herd to try to have it as homogeneous as possible. That's going to create a more consistent product for the person that they're trying to sell that beef to in the end. And I would say some of the breeds, yeah, are probably going to be more um, breeds that you might want to target more ground beef out of. There's going to be some breeds and crosses that you may want to target more steaks out of and less ground beef, right? So it just totally depends. And when we get a lot of questions about grass-fed beef, um, Grass-fed beef is really interesting here in the United States. In my personal opinion, the average American does not have the palate for grass-fed beef. 
Um, that's my opinion. That's what we see. Um, now, grass-fed burger, I love a grass-fed burger, but uh, we do not see the same experience for people on the grass-fed steak side of things. Um, so you got to keep that in mind, too. Um, I'll, I'll say this also on feeding. If, if somebody's trying to put feed to their cattle to put more marmaling in them, um, I don't care what breed it is, you know, 60, 80 days, 90 days is not going to do it. Uh, you've got to go longer than that. And you've got to get closer to an industry standard number of days on feed to really have a marbling effect in that animal uh, when we or any other processor slaughters it. So we, we do have producers sometimes that, you know, brings a calf in um, and cattle don't get lost in our plant. They all, every one of our carcasses uh, gets barcoded. Everything's computerized. Everything's scanned. And um, but yet you do have those carcasses from time to time that when we rib that carcass to expose that ribeye and it's doesn't have very much marbling in it and the producer gets upset because they say they, they can say well man i've i've been feeding this calf for 60 days well the industry average is 180 right so it takes marbling is not a fast happening feature it's a slow process unfortunately so you do have to get them on feed longer to get a higher marbling effect Another thing I'll say uh, that's really important to remember is get them as big as you can. Okay, so the bigger the animal, and I'm talking 1,100 pounds and bigger, the bigger, the better red meat yield that you're going to have, the more product that you're going to take home. Because a 1,000 pound animal and a 1,200 pound animal have about the same size skeletal frame, but that 1,200 pound animal has a lot more red meat and product hanging on that same skeletal frame. Right, so get them bigger. Uh, Grass-fed cattle, you want to get them bigger. Get them over a thousand pounds. Uh, that's just more product that you're going to be that you're going to take home for sure. Absolutely. Well, Dustin, I, I certainly appreciate your time today. I know your time is very valuable, and I would tell anybody that's listening to this deal, if you're anywhere in Central or South Texas, look Dean and Peeler up. You guys have done a phenomenal job. Your plan is amazing down there. Your feedlot's amazing. Y'all have got. Uh, some y'all really got some interesting things happening down there and you've done an excellent job marketing your product and it sure seems like you, you do an excellent job marketing product for others as well because yeah. you're incredibly service oriented and always looking to to find the new best thing or to increase your your uh, product uh, availability so well uh, this isn't a this isn't necessarily just a plug for specialty risk but it is a 100 uh, percent accurate statement that that are we, we've been through some issues like every other plant does um it's not it's not all sunshine and rainbows every single day when you're in um when you're in a factory type setting especially in a kill plant and we've had some wrecks and uh, it just happens but but especially risk insurance has gotten us out of every one of them i will say that so no well, i appreciate you. it dustin we try hard yeah just like y'all i think that's why we're a good mix you know we both yeah, right. got our right. customers so right well, i appreciate well, you, you. Tell your family I said hello, and uh, thank you for your okay. time. I'll do it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. All right.